So blood from the capillaries is going to flow into venules, the venules are going to flow into smaller veins and into a network of larger veins. And this column of blood here represents these veins in the leg. So the bottom part of the column here is representing the anterior and posterior tibial veins and the short saphenous vein. Coming up to the knee we have the popliteal, popliteal vein at the level of the knee. Higher up we've got the femoral vein and as a superficial vein we've got the great uh, saphenous vein as well. Then going up as it goes through the into the pelvis we've got the external iliac vein, the common iliac vein and that's taking the blood into the inferior vena cava which of course carries on up and goes into the right atrium of the heart. Now in normal circumstances there are valves punctuating this coursework of veins and the valves allow blood to go from the periphery up towards the centre but they won't let the blood go from the centre back towards the periphery. So there's a one-way flow of blood. So the blood can go from here, through some valves to here, through some valves to here, and work its way back up. That's a simplification, of course. When you contract your calf muscle, the blood will actually scoot back up under fairly high pressure. The trouble is, of course, there's sometimes diseases of these valves can be caused by phlebitis, can be caused by deep venous thrombosis, complicating pregnancy, obesity, or some people are born with congenital absence of the bicuspid valves in their veins or, or weak valves. And these people are prone to develop chronic venous insufficiency syndrome caused by chronic venous hypertension. Now, if you think about it, if we don't have the valves punctuating the veins, then what we've got in essence is just this single column of blood. It would just be like this. I mean, I know it goes through many veins, but it's in, a, in, a, in essence one column. So without the valves, there would be one column of blood that actually goes from the right atrium all the way down through the inferior vena cava, the iliac, the femoral, down the popliteal, anterior, posterior, tibial, all the way to the ankle as one column of blood. And blood has a weight. So as you go further down this venous column, if there's no valves to compartmentalise the weight of the blood, then by the time you get down to the bottom, you're going to have very high hydrostatic pressures. And in severe chronic venous insufficiency with chronic venous hypertension, the pressures here can be 50, 60, 70, 80, even 90 millimetres of mercury pressure have been measured in people with severe venous insufficiency. And that actually explains why most venous leg ulcers are going to be low down in the leg, where the venous pressure is highest. So the most common site for venous leg ulcers is this gaiter area where they used to wear gaiters in the old days. This area above the ankle, lower part of the leg, is the gaiter area. That is the most common site for venous leg ulceration because the venous pressure is highest in there because of the hydrostatic pressure generated by this column of blood due to the venous insufficiency. So remember, normally the venous insufficiency is reduced or the venous hypertension is reduced. In fact, there isn't any normally because of the valves. In fact, in, in normal situations, when you're exercising, if you've got healthy veins, the pressure in these veins will be almost zero when you're exercising. So normally the valves do a very good job of keeping this pressure low. But if the valves are damaged, chronic venous hypertension is going to lead to chronic venous insufficiency syndrome.